Hello, everyone. My name is Zeus. My name is Jack. Uh, we're here today at Williamstown, Massachusetts, United States, at a rainy morning to talk about our current work during the small research experience for undergraduates at Williams College. We're very, very happy to be here at the International Fibonacci Conference. I hope you all having a good first day at Sarajevo. All right, today we're gonna to talk about second drops compositions and how they behave under addition. So first of all, what are, for us, Fibonacci numbers will be F1 equals one, F2 equals one, and so on. And by doing that, we have second drops theorem that says that every non-negative integer can be uniquely written as a sum of non-adjacent Fibonacci numbers. And today I want to compare that to uh, a very similar theorem that says that every non-negative integer can be uniquely written as a sum of parts of two. So there's a extra restriction on the first theorem, but they're very similar. And so th that means that in base two, we associate non-negative integers to strings of zeros and ones, while in Zeckendorf, we associate uh, non-negative integers to a string of zeros and ones without consecutive ones. For example, 14 is eight plus four plus one, and that's why we write it as one, 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 zero in base two with infinitely many zeros to the left. And 14 for in Zeckendorf is gonna be 13 plus one, so F6 plus F1. And that's gonna be one, one, sorry. That's gonna be one, zero, 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 one uh, with infinitely zeros to the left. In equations, we're gonna write uh, 14 as that string and close it by parenthesis sub F. Um, and we're also gonna be interested today in the number of summons uh, and the decomposition of X. So we're gonna, to find that as being z of x. Uh, another variable that's gonna be useful today is uh, z sub i x, which is going to be one if uh, a sum of f i is in the second of composition of x and zero otherwise. So we, for example, have the relation that z is the sum of z i's. All right, we can do arithmetic with uh, 14 and five. We can do arithmetic with the decompositions. So for example, 14 plus five, uh, we can add their strings uh, coordinate by coordinate and get the decomposition of 19. Yay. Warning, this does not always lead to the Zackendorf decomposition. It always leads to a decomposition, but not always the Zackendorf. So for example, if you have 14 plus two, when we add them, we have two consecutive ones. That's not allowed. Nevertheless, we can use the relation that F1 plus F2 is F3 in this case to simplify it and get the second half composition of 16. Another thing that can go wrong is if, for example, for, we add 14 and 13, they both have uh, 13 in the decomposition, F6, and we cannot have two of the same summit. But we can use the fact that two times F6 is F7 plus F4, to simplify that string and get the Zeckendorf composition of 27. So we need those extra rules to simplify when we add kind of coordinate by coordinate the strings. So there's this thing that a previous model group studied, which was a Zeckendorf game, which consists of moves, which are these simplifications that I explained earlier. So we change two consecutives to the next one. We change two F1s to uh, F2, two, two F2s to so F1 plus F3, two Fi's for a larger value of I to Fi minus one, Fi plus one. Sorry, two Fi's to Fi minus two plus Fi plus one. There's a theorem that the previous model group proved that given any initial Fibonacci, initial state of Fibonacci numbers, so any sum that we give, if we apply those simplifications, those operations, the second graph game terminates, so we cannot apply those simplifications forever, and it terminates at the in the second graph composition. So that's another perspective that we get in second graph composition. Uh, how to get them? We can just play the game. All right. Well, now let's talk a little bit more about the addition. How addition plays a role in that? Uh, so recall that z of x is the number of summons in the second graph composition for x. Uh, a first property that we have is that z of x plus y is at most z of x plus z of y. Why that? Uh, if we add, if we have the second of composition of x and the second of composition of y, we add them uh, coordinate by coordinate, kind of naively, uh, we get uh, z x plus z y summons. 
When we play the game, the Zangendorf game, at the end of the game, we're going to have the Zangendorf composition of alpha x plus y, and we're going to have the zx plus y summons. But every move of the Zangendorf game does not increase the number of summons. It either stays the same or it decreases. So that's why the, this relation holds. What other properties uh, do, does this function z hold under addition? That's what we're exploring today. One way to think about that question is to fix a t and pick a random x represented by just to be concrete represented by a string of zero uh, of size n so for example uh not for example so x is going to have uh, a one in the nth position uh, and that's going to imply that there's a zero at the n minus one position and we can choose kind of arbitrarily the, the rest um this is equivalent to picking x uh, between fn and fn plus one. And as, as a side note, that's gonna be useful later, there are fn minus one of the numbers that satisfy this. So whenever you have n minus two consecutive, um, whenever I have n minus two consecutive digits in the second draft string to select, the number of ways to do that is fn minus one. So our question is, how do we compare z of x and z of x plus t? Or more precisely, how do we compare this variable that I'm calling deltas, delta t of z? That, that is the difference between them. What is the distribution of it? Okay, so for t equals one, we can describe the distribution of delta z exactly. Um, the theorem that we proved is that when x is uniformly chosen in that interval, as n goes to infinity, the probability that the variable delta z is one is going to be theta minus two, that it's zero is gonna be theta minus two, that's gonna be minus one is gonna be theta minus four. And after that, it follows this, uh, our, this geometric progression with ratio theta minus two. We're gonna to prove today that fact for, uh, t, uh, for t equals one and L equals one. So we're basically gonna prove that the probability that delta Z is gonna be one is theta minus two. Okay, so we want to count uh, to, to determine how many numbers satisfy delta z equals one. That's going to be if and only if, del, uh, if z x plus one equals to z x plus one. And that's only going to happen if the second draft composition of x terminates with two zeros. Uh, because when we add them, if there's, a, if there's a one at either location, a simplification is going to happen and the number is going to, the, the, number, the number of sum is going to go down. And in this case, uh, this is only, only going to change the zero to one. So we're going to have a net sum of one. When this happens, this happen, we're having to choose uh, n minus four digits in a second of string. So by a shifting argument, the number of ways that this can happen is fn minus three. Out of the original fn minus one total numbers, uh, the ratio is going to be the probability is going to be the ratio, which is going to be fn minus three over fn minus one. And as n goes to infinity, that tends to theta minus two. A similar analysis is going to work for t equals one and arbitrary l. For arbitrary t, while we cannot just describe the distribution exactly, we can describe the distribution for large enough values. And what happens in larger enough values is that. Uh, the same tail that we saw before. So after some point, there was a geometric uh, series. It, it, also, it also happens here uh, at a cutoff or off around log t, negative log, log t. Okay, so for fixed t and random x, we can compare pretty well uh, z of x plus t versus z of x. For random x and y, how can we compare z of x plus y and Z of X, Z of Y. That's what Jack's going to talk today. All right. Thank you, Zeus. So recall that ZX plus Y is at most ZX plus ZY. And the reason this was because you can play the Zeckendorf game by adding the strings of X and Y on top of each other. You'll have perhaps adjacent ones or places where two ones stack on top of each other and produce a two. So by simplifying these things, the number of summons can only go down, and this results in zx plus y being at most zx plus zy. This motivates us, however, to define the statistic txy 
to be zx plus cy minus z of x plus y. Um, so it's a non-negative statistic, and it is useful for the following reason. We believe that choosing xn and yn uniformly from fn to fn plus 1, the statistic t will be asymptotically normal as n goes to infinity. And why might we make such a conjecture besides large data? It's because of the previous work of a small group by Kologlu, Kopp, Miller, and Wang in 2010, which says that the random variable zxn on its own is asymptotically normal in the sense that when you have it to have mean 0 and variance 1, it will converge to the standard Gaussian. So just recall that t is going to be a sum of multiple z's. And each one of these is asymptotically normal. Yes, even x plus y. That will x plus y will have a slightly different dif different distribution than x and y, but it is still um, a smooth enough discrete distribution that z will also be asymptotically normal. So you're summing three normals together. You'd expect that's normal, except x plus y depends on x and y. So there's a little bit of a dependence here. So in order to get around this, we've had to begin um, thinking stochastically. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The original work uses de Moivre-Laplace and a Sterling formula to explicitly calculate um, the, num the number of xn in that interval fn and fn plus one, which have exactly k sum ends. The stars and bars problem is used here to get that it the number of xn which satisfied this is n minus k choose k minus one. The probability, because it's uniform, you just divide by the number of integers in that interval. But again, as I said, to generalize from z to t, which is the sum of multiple z, we need to think stochastically because there is some dependence. So let's first see how to think stochastically when looking at Lekerkerker's theorem, an original result by Lekerkerker in 1951, which says that if xn in fn to fn plus one is uniformly distributed as we've been working with, the expectation of the number of sum ends of the Zeckendorf decomposition is n over phi squared plus one plus big O of one. So an alternative way of proving this without using stars and bars problem, and which will generalize to other recurrence sequences, is that the number of xn, which have the ith Fibonacci number in the Zeckendorf decomposition is fi minus one, fn minus i minus two over the number of things in the interval. So by Binet's formula, this actually simplifies to one over phi squared plus one plus big O phi to the minus i error. So one can view these indicator random variables zi as Bernoulli random variables where the parameter is tending to one over phi squared plus one rapidly with exponential decay. So you can essentially think of them as, because they converge in distribution so fast as you're summing multiple identical random variables. But there is some um, dependence between them. So if we want to prove this normality result from 2010, we need to show that the covariance is very small, that there's little correlation between these um, Bernoulli random variables. And in fact, it is. Again, expanding and doing combinatorics and then using Binet's formula, one will see that the covariance between ZR and ZS is exponentially decaying in terms of the distance between R and S. So if the indices are far apart, the behavior of those indices and the decomposition of a integer um, is roughly uncorrelated. And then we can apply the central limit theor theorem for strongly mixing random variables. You're summing many Bernoulli random variables of roughly the same parameter with roughly zero correlation. Again, you have to be careful managing the exponential decay error, but it's such a fast decay that um, any statistical theorem that is widely known will ensure um, a central limit theorem. So in going from Z to T, just recall that we've decomposed Z as true indicator Bernoulli random variables, Z1, X through Zn, X. To go to T, we decompose T into indicator-like random variables, T1 through Tn plus one, just have to add an extra one because x plus y is slightly larger than x and y. And these smaller random variables, tj, are given as zjx plus zjy minus zjx plus y. So now we sort of have a, a method of attack for showing that t is asymptotically normal. The first step is showing that tj rapidly converges as first we send n to infinity, meaning that you look at larger and larger string numbers while fixing an index that will converge in distribution 
uh, the indicator um, roughly of the string there, what ones and zeros are happening at this location. And then once that converges in distribution, we send J to infinity afterwards. So we look at basically infinite string numbers, and then we move to larger and larger indices in these infinite string numbers, and we get rapid convergence again with exponential error, thanks to Binet. The second step is that, okay, we have these sums of almost identical random variables. We need some uncorrelated result. And this is, again, as you just move out indices, for larger and larger indices, we know the covariance, for example, between ZR and ZS, in this case, ZJ1 and ZJ2, will be uncorrelated. But there's extra work we need to do, and we need to be a little bit more clever in the, that extra factor of um, X plus Y. So then again, if you have an uncorrelated result, you can apply central limit theorem, and that finishes a proof of asymptotic normality. So this key ingredient for the second bullet point, what new method might we need for um, uncorrelatedness? And that is long runs of zeros. So we have sort of a gap lemma that the number of integers where you have a run of L zeros in a row, where L is gonna be fixed as you send N to infinity, this is one minus big O exponential decay. And this C is coming from some auxiliary polynomial that we calculate, but Either way, we get exponential decay. And this allows us to divide most integer strings into pieces. So you can write any x. So for example, here we just expect for most x, there will be a gap of five zeros. And then five zeros is enough that you can decompose x. Look at a string to the right of those five zeros. Look at a string to the left of those five zeros. And playing the Zeckendorf game on each piece, um, it's sort of like you're playing on independent boards because this gap of five zeros is too um, large for any ones to jump over. And as a final generalization, we believe that the statistic T, which is sort of looking at counts of indices at the jth index of X, the jth index of Y, and then subtracting what happens at the string for X plus Y, we believe this normality result will apply in general to positive linear recurrence sequences, such as the Tribonacci numbers with proper um, initial conditions, base B decompositions, as we saw with binary, even base 10, as well as pretty much any recurrent sequence with non-negative integer coefficients. One simply has to make sure that A sub N minus one has a positive integer coefficient. It can't be zero. There can be zeros in between as we see here. And then it just ends, for example, with 20 A sub N minus 17. Again, there are some canonical initial conditions that have been outlined in the research, but we believe normality will hold again by considering probabilistically um, large gap sizes, as we saw with runs of zeros. All right. Thank you so much.